from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. We believe the AI wave will bring profound changes not only to the technology industry, but to society as a whole. These changes will perhaps be as significant to the world as the agricultural industrial revolutions, both of which had drastic economic consequences. While the exact progression and timing of these changes are unpredictable, one thing is clear. The AI wave will not be possible without advancements in and a stable supply of hardware and software generally, and silicon specifically. The complexity of semiconductor design and manufacturing combined with rapid innovation and the vulnerability of the supply chain creates unique and challenging dynamics that in our view are reshaping leadership in the semiconductor industry. Our forecast shows that the combined revenues of one, companies that supply manufacturing equipment, components, and software to build fabrication facilities, two, chip and AI software designers, and three, chip manufacturers, will surpass $1 trillion this decade. Our research suggests that four companies, NVIDIA, TSM, Broadcom, and Qualcomm, will account for almost half of that trillion dollar opportunity. Hello and welcome to this week's theCUBE Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, CUBE Research Analyst Emeritus David Floyer and I quantify and forecast the dynamic semiconductor ecosystem with market shares from 2023 and a five-year outlook for more than a dozen of the top players in the ecosystem and the industry. With a view of where we see the overall market headed, our assumptions for the market and individual top players which firms we see winning and losing and why with a bit of survey data from ETR. And we'll also address the following five items. One, how sustainable is NVIDIA's moat? Two, what's the impact of competition on NVIDIA, including from hyperscalers, Intel, AMD, and others? The challenges faced by only two companies that both design and manufacture semiconductors in that leaderboard, both Intel and Samsung. What the opportunities at the edge mean for firms and competition, and finally risks to our scenarios, including geopolitical, technological, and energy risks. David, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Love working with you, man. Good to see you. Thanks for the invitation. This is a fascinating subject. Indeed it is. All right, let's start with the macro impact that the Gen AI awakening has had on IT spending in the last two years. This data from ETR shows the 19 sectors tracked quarterly by ETR. The vertical axis, if you follow the show, you know is spending velocity or net score. And the horizontal plane is the pervasion of the sector within the survey. We've shown this data many times, but note where AI was one month prior to ChatGPT's launch in October, 2022, that survey, it dropped just below that 40% red magic line, which is always an indicator of highly elevated spending momentum. So that month it dropped below and since then has been up and to the right. Consequently, other sectors have been suppressed as we've been reporting. 40% of customers indicate that they're funding AI by stealing from other budgets. And we know that generally enterprise AI ROI is coming in small productivity wins that this time and for most organizations, that at this time and for most organizations is not yet self-funding. And the point is, that AI is consuming not only the conversation, but also some of the spending momentum. But David, why AI, why now, and what does it mean for businesses leaving the societal impacts for another day? But, but why and what does it mean? Well, I, I believe there are three significant impacts uh, for all businesses. Mm -hmm. The first is improvement on everybody as productivity. Um, it probably is in the order, if you're a, a significant uh, user of AI, uh, in the order of 20% now, and, and that probably can grow to 50% over the next few years. But I believe more critical to business is a quality of service. For example, any representative should be able to answer any customer or prospective customer question correctly, accurately, straight away. Or the customer can ask on the website, their web, the business's website by voice in the language of their choice. The quality of service should be 
able to be significantly improved with AI, and everybody should be trying to do it. But I think the most important value of AI to businesses is the potential automation of business processes. This, the elimination essentially of people within that business processes, and that leads to a reduction and simplification of the business processes and the company as a whole. So my advice to CEOs or CIOs uh, is a combination of all three are essential. If you're not planning uh, for a tenfold productivity improvement over the next five to 10 years, there'll be startups that will do it and take your business. Great, thank you for that excellent setup. But let's cut right to the chase, David. Um, you got NVIDIA momentum is simply remarkable and has caught the attention of everyone in the industry, the pace of innovation coming out of the AI e ecosystem generally and NVIDIA specifically is astounding. Here's a diagram that underscores that the new era in computing that we're, we're in is catalyzed by large language models and the, and the AI breakthroughs. The chart shows the teraflop progression NVIDIA has made since 2016 compared to Moore's law and that progression. And the comparison is, is stark and it's enlightening. It's 1000 X improvement in parallel or what we sometimes call matrix computing in just eight years versus a hundred X improvement from Moore's law in a decade. But David, it's really important for the audience to understand that in this episode, we're forecasting the semiconductor industry ecosystem and we're taking some liberties with the scope. And by that, I mean that we're modeling NVIDIA as a full platform solution and a company that is building end-to-end -end AI data centers, what they call AI factories. And they're selling that capability through partners one of the key aspects of NVIDIA's moat is that they build entire AI systems and then disaggregate and sell them. As such, when they sell AI offerings, be they chips or networking or software, et cetera, they know where the bottlenecks are and they can fine tune the systems. But NVIDIA's moat, in our view, is deep and wide. They have an ecosystem and are driving innovation hard. They've announced there's another big chip behind Blackwell, that's no surprise, but they're on a one year cadence for systems and networking and chips. And they're going hard after ethernet, they're extending their proprietary NV link for homogeneous AI factories and InfiniBand's roadmap continues. Jensen's claim and bet is the more you spend with NVIDIA, the more you save and the more money you make, the more revenue you can drive. David, take us through your view of NVIDIA's moat and its, its durability and what this data means. Well, this data means uh, if it project, continues to project, and I, I think it will, is that we will be having a million um, teraflops uh, in five years time. And uh, that is just amazing. Um, but the important thing for Nivea is it's introduced a whole AI platform. It's got specialized GPUs, specialized CPUs, networking, cooling, complete system software. It's got CUDA, which is by far the best software in the industry. Uh, it's the key AI platform. Uh, NVIDIA can deliver a whole AI data center. Um, nothing has been this introduced that's this revolutionary, in my opinion, since IBM introduced the, the 360 uh, 60 years ago. <clears throat> uh, in addition, their, their drive is, their, their, their goal is to crank it up every year, uh, introduce a new system every year. Uh, in, in my opinion, the value to the users, to the people in uh, the hyperscalers and everybody else who are using these technologies is so high. Uh, and the cost of creating alternatives to this is also so high that NVIDIA is set for at least the next five years in, to be the dominant supplier in the AI data center. Yeah, and we started there uh, because NVIDIA leads sort of the, the, the top of our forecast going forward. Now let's get into the meat of this research and our five-year outlook for the ecosystem because NVIDIA is not alone. It's a, it's a big, big market, uh, but they, as I say, they are leading. David, we're going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, this table lays out how we see the semiconductor industry evolving. And the data shows in the first column, the players, 
in the ecosystem, which comprises the chip designers like Qualcomm, the chip manufacturers like TSMC, the two firms, which do both, Intel and Samsung, uh, the equipment manufacturers like ASML and, and Applied Materials, and software providers like Cadence, which is not shown in the leaderboard, but it's in the other category. And so they're just smaller than, than these firms. Of course, we're, we're also including NVIDIA, which is where we started this, this episode, which we believe has become and will continue to be the most important player in the market. And again, we've pushed the envelope a bit in terms of the forecast and are including items beyond just chips, like related AI systems and software coming out of NVIDIA, David mentioned CUDA and, and you know, some other capabilities. But for each company, we're showing their related revenue in 2010 and 2023 and our forecast for 2028 for each firm with a CAGR for each of those time periods. Now the methodology we use uh, was to build a series of related models that ingested relevant financial data. And then we combine this data with our fundamental assumptions to create a top-down model of the industry as we describe it here. And then we tested this data with two external data points and added a third dimension. So this included, first of all, company strategic forecasts based on their long-term financial frameworks that they provide financial uh, investors. The second was inputs from various financial analysts that have made long-term projections, largely maybe based on their own assumptions or based on company projections for these companies. And then thirdly, we applied our own assumptions about how we see the market playing out. And we're going to share that our assumptions and the resulting forecast deviated quite widely from generally expected market narratives. And in particular, the broad consensus when you take into account the publicly available data essentially says that everybody wins and the disruption to existing firms will be modest. We don't see it this way. Rather, we see a forecast. We see, we're forecasting a dramatic shift into Again, this is what we sometimes call matrix computing or what NVIDIA calls accelerated computing. And we see dramatic spending shifts causing market dislocations, particularly to traditional x86 markets. David Floyer led this effort. David, anything you'd add to the methodology and the approach here? Uh, no, it's, um, uh, it's been a, a joint exercise and it's, uh, it's very detailed. Uh, I think we should just um, uh, start going through it. All right, let's do it. Okay, the high level findings in our market assessment are as follows. The global semiconductor ecosystem with our expanded scope surpasses 900 billion by 2028 and will approximate a trillion by 2030. We've got a 10% CAGR and the whole nut from 23 to 28, which is actually quite huge when you think about the size of this thing. It's a massive market and there's also a massive market dynamic shift uh, away from general purpose x86 toward parallel AI computing architectures or matrix computing. Samsung, Samsung and Intel, and there are some others in other, but those are the big two bucking the trend by vertically integrating design and manufacturing. Uh, AI PCs we see going mainstream and are not only participate in the Windows refresh, so it's gonna be more than a one-time hit. It's gonna change in our view, the dynamics of the useful life of PCs, we see that compressing. ARM-based designs are going to dominate the market volume and will confer significant advantage to those firms that are up the ARM learning curve. And then high bandwidth memory, memory demand for, for memory suppliers is going to create a tailwind for those companies that can produce them. Now, let's look at the data in more detail by company sorted by our 2028 projections in the right-hand column in descending order, we'll start with NVIDIA. NVIDIA, in our view, essentially has a monopoly, somewhat similar to Wintel's duopoly of the 1990s with the core GPU dominance and essentially the AI operating system all in the same company. We believe NVIDIA's growth rate will actually accelerate as it penetrates new markets and will surpass, the company's revenue will surpass 160 billion by 2028. Now, Importantly, David, again, we're including more than just chips in this forecast. We're assuming NVIDIA's full platform and portfolio revenue. And the assumption is that NVIDIA will continue to execute across that portfolio on a rapid cadence. Your thoughts on NVIDIA? Well, I, I, I think NVIDIA has been, uh, has executed uh, absolutely brilliantly. Um, 
they have gone for very large chips. Um, they've invested in that uh, and their GPUs. They've invested in uh, another type of CPU as well. They've specialized completely in the AI uh, matrix computing or, or accelerated computing, as they call it. Um, uh, by doing so, uh, they are offering a complete solution, a, a complete data center that can be taken. So I'm very confident that they can sustain this for the, for the next five years. Okay, moving on. TSM is the next on the list. This firm has become the go-to manufacturer for advanced chips. We have TSM almost doubling in size over the next five years. And our number one assumption is that the volume economics confer major strategic advantage to TSM. And they remain by far the world's number one foundry. David, your input on TSM. Um, yeah, I think it's very important that to, to notice how TSMC are investing uh, strongly in this. Uh, they've just announced the A16 process, uh, which is a significant amount in chip manufacturing. It's, it's going to have the uh, nano sheet uh, transistors and the backside power rail. Uh, they, they're calling it the super power rail. Um, these innovations are, are you know, they are leading the the business, the, the whole whole industry, by leaps and bounds, and they are winning business from everybody. So I, I think they are executing in in a, an exemplary exemplary way. All right, let's keep going here. Um, next on the list is Broadcom, and we're we're only including its semiconductor revenue here, not VMware, and as such. We think while the company's CAGR slows to 10%, it's really because in 2010, it was very small. Much of Broadcom's 2023 revenue back then was dispersed in our model under the other category. We didn't go back and, and add up all the pro forma and, and include it in. So we just, we just kept it as Broadcom proper at the time. Broadcom has done a remarkable job through acquisitions and hardcore engineering. It doesn't compete head on with NVIDIA, for example, and GPUs, Although it is a major provider of silicon and AI chip IP for Google and Meta, and we think now ByteDance is its third custom silicon company, that all three of those companies are building their own GPUs. So it, it's, its custom silicon group has, has bagged three big whales, and that's going to drive long-term sustainable revenue. We see Broadcom semiconductor business growing at a CAGR of 10% over the next five years taking the division to 1.6 times its current size. And David, Broadcom really does the hard work to connect all the GPUs and CPUs and NPUs and accelerators and all that high bandwidth memory together. They're betting that, that the world is moving and they're right, is to a connect centric environment from a CPU centric environment. And they're really uniquely positioned to continue to win in the market they play in virtually all sectors, consumer, enterprise, mobile, cloud, internet, edge. Any comments on Broadcom? Yeah, it's a, it's a very well positioned company. It's going to focus particularly on networking, uh, which is going to be super important. Um, high speed networking uh, of all types is going to be absolutely essential uh, for AI processing. And they are very well positioned, and in particular, they're very well set up with Google, who's who's going to be a major player in this in this marketplace. All right. Next, we're going to move on to Qualcomm, which is very well positioned both in mobile and now in AI PCs. We see them getting a huge tailwind from the recently introduced new Windows AI PC stack from Microsoft. We see Qualcomm on a similar trajectory as Broadcom. Essentially, David, Microsoft with its Windows Copilot. In, uh, in release 11 is following Apple's move from several years ago. And that's going to be a big benefit for Qualcomm, which provides core silicon for AI PCs. And it's, you know, we think bad news for x86 PCs. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, Qualcomm has, uh, it's just amazing that a Microsoft announced full support for ARM uh, based PCs. Uh, and they're based on Qualcomm, uh, uh, joint work between them and Qualcomm. And now Dell, Lenovo, and others have announced uh, ARM-based PCs. And, and suddenly 
you've got a whole plethora of these and and they're selling them on the basis of improved performance over in, in their case they're they're aiming at uh, apple but but they're obviously improved performance against intel and 24 hour battery life i mean this this uh, as a as a a product uh, in the marketplace that supports AI specifically, uh, Microsoft uh, version of the AI, uh, and needs MPUs is just an amazing change. Thank you. Okay, so you can see in our forecast, it indicates it looks like the four horsemen, the four companies at the top, NVIDIA, TSM, Broadcom, and Qualcomm comprise around 45% of the market by 2028, based on uh, our forecast. So let's move on to Intel. We're forecasting Intel's foundry revenue to comprise about 22 billion of a $54 billion business in 2028. So unlike many, we're forecasting no growth for Intel over this time period. We see the rise in foundry revenue unable to offset the decline in x86. Combined with our assumption that AMD continues to gain share in x86 markets, we have Intel's data center and client business combined going to 45 billion was at 45 billion in 2023. We see that dropping to 26 billion in 2028. Intel's late with support for AI PCs, and we're projecting a 12 to 18 month delay in its 14A process, which is its big bet. It combines gate all around technology. They call that ribbon FET, uh, backside power delivery, which Intel refers to as power via. And it's going to be the first to use high NAEUV technology, very bold, but also very, very dangerous. David, your comments on Intel. Yes, you, you've outlined three uh, leading edge technologies, uh, which they are uh, trying to, in, 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 uh, trying to uh, introduce. And the, the, those are high risk, um, uh, for success, they need all three to be successful to make them differentiate from the rest of the industry. And if you just take probabilities and multiply them, uh, that's a that's a tough tough uh, objective they've set themselves. I I think they will get there with two of them. Um, I'm not sure about the new technology, um, but those two should should be important unless somebody else introduces that new technology. But I don't believe that they will get them uh, in 2027. I think there will be 20, 2028, 2029, maybe even 2030 before they get volume production and high yield. And the, the, the key about Intel is that they, they have didn't have the volume. Why other people did better, why Apple did better, why TSMC bet it has done so well, is the volume from ARM-based PCs uh, that has driven the marketplace and, and really uh, now is uh, get, um, in enormous business pressure on Intel. Yeah, just to clarify, I think you mean ARM-based PCs are coming, but really, ARM-based uh, ARM uh, smartphones. Sorry, PCs and, 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 and cell phones and yeah. just business in general. They, right. they are 10 times the number of wafers are ARM-based than, than x86. Now, look, if Intel is able to pull off those three innovations uh, and, and hit the, the 14A proposed timeframe, it does set them up well for the 2030s. Uh, but we think that's a big if, and hence our assumption that it'll be 12 to 18 months delayed. All right, let's quickly go down the rest of the list and share our assumptions as to how we got to these figures. Uh, ASML has unique differentiation that is going to remain unmatched. I mean, David, essentially we see ASML as, as a monopoly that's going to yep. continue and they'll be able to command whatever pricing they want. Yeah. Okay, and then SK Hynix, High bandwidth memory has become, you know, the new thing. It's in, it's in super high demand, and the supply uh, or demand way outstrips the supply, um, and that is going to uh, propel SK Hynix. Uh, we have SK Hynix here, a, a growing, uh, actually accelerating uh, its CAGR. Uh, so the company we say we forecast grows from 25 billion today 
to 40 billion. David, anything you want to add on uh, SK Hynix? No, I mean, they've done an amazing job. Uh, High-speed memory is incredibly important. And they've got the three version of that high speed version and the E version. Uh, they they are they are driving well. Uh, Samsung. We would think Samsung is going to struggle to get its advanced process working. We that's that's we know this, and we think it's going to continue to 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 struggle. And we think that constricts volumes and puts them in a on a cost dilemma. Uh, we've got Samsung basically flat. You know, forty billion today projected to, to stay basically flat over the period. You know, these cycles are cyclical, obviously. You've seen it a lot. You certainly saw it with COVID um, and you saw it coming out of the isolation economy. You saw COVID spike up, coming out. You know, we, we saw some of the semis take a hit and then come back. So it does bounce around, but you know, given Samsung struggles, we think it is the right target for Intel, just a matter as to whether or not Intel can get there. Intel has said, David, that you know, it intends to be the number two foundry uh, by the end of the end of the decade, by 2030. Uh, so in that sense, uh, going after Samsung is the right move. Any other thoughts on Samsung? Yeah, I, I agree. We have uh, 22 billion uh, in foundry revenue. Uh, that's from internal and external uh, for um, Intel in 2028. And uh, a lot of that's going to come from uh, Samsung, in my opinion, and that's why we have it uh, flat um, and, and and under pressure. Um, it's still going to be uh, a challenge, actually. I think for Samsung even to maintain uh, their their revenue, I think they they are under a lot of pressure. Well, just a finer point there. I mean, we really have we have really have TSMC as the big winner. Um, oh, absolutely. If if yeah. Intel, if if our assumptions are in, are on Intel are incorrect, and they are able to get 14A uh, shipping with those three innovations in 2027, our 22 billion dollars will be conservative and low because Intel will have its internal uh, captive uh, 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 market. So I just wanted to put a finer point on that. TSM in our model is the big winner. Samsung and Intel continue to struggle and until they can get yields up, uh, TSM you know, gets the lion's share. Just wanted to make that point, David. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, yeah. Okay, let's go on to AMD. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Lisa Sue has done an amazing job with this company. The key for them was when they shed their, their, their fabs, uh, which Jerry Sanders used to famously said, you know, real men, Oh, build fabs. Well, that didn't really prove out uh, for, for AMD. They shed that and it took several years for them to get back on track. And then obviously they're doing exceedingly well. Having said that, they're very much tied still to x86. By 2028, the end of our forecast period, we still have AMD uh, at 45% of their revenue coming from x86. Now, the good news for AMD is it's still, it we, our, our assumptions are that it continues to steal share from Intel, and it also will do well in AI hardware, you know, but that x86, those x86 overall declines will, will pressure them. So they have to continue to gain share from Intel. Of course, Intel's going to fight like crazy for its x86 data center share, try to hold on to that as long as it can. Um, so, you know, we're more uh, sanguine uh, on AMD's outlook as a chip designer. They're not saddled by foundry. Uh, but it's that x86 pressure. So they have to, they are a company in transition to that AI era. David, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, and if they didn't have that impact, uh, they would be growing much faster. So I, I think they're going to be uh, a major contributor to AI. Um, but the, the, the percentage is lower because of that pullback from uh, having from the x86 uh, marketplace. Uh, they will take market share from uh, Intel, in my opinion. They, they just are uh, faster to market and, and, and have actually better um, uh, x86. And for example, Oracle has just gone all ARM-based uh, uh, chips for, for their data centers. So 
They're doing extremely well. You mean AMD? Yeah. You mean AMD for yeah, for, sorry, for, uh, for, for I'm exadata? AMD. They do yeah. have ARM with uh, Ampere, but yeah, they're they're yeah. they're exadata. Uh, uh, recent Exadata line. Their Exadata. Uh, a, 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 yes. AMD. And we did an analysis on that, and it's, it's a substantial improvement over the uh, Intel based uh, systems. Um, okay, let's move on to uh, applied materials AMAT. Uh, we think they continue to execute, they're in a really good position, but they have more competition than does ASML. But we've got them doing you know, you know pretty well here, uh, growing from uh, uh, 27 billion in 2023 to 35 billion with a 6% CAGR, um, right in, in you know, pretty close to uh, the size of, you know, we've basically got ASML, SK Hynix, Samsung, AMD, and AMAT, you know, all around, you know, that 35 to $40 billion range. David, anything you'd, you'd add on uh, applied materials? No, I'm, yeah. Okay, um, let's go on to Apple. There's been a lot of rumors that Apple's going to going to sell uh, its silicon, you know, as a merchant silicon supplier. But let's, let's suffice to say that Apple getting into the this, the business of manufacturing its own chips was profound. Uh, it's, it started with its A series in smartphones, and now of course the M series. Everybody wants to get an M series. They were the first to ship NPUs, uh, both in the iPhone and in uh, PCs. Uh, now they got to make you know major step up as this AI uh, 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 PC competition heats up. But but we're, so essentially what we're doing here is we're, we we modeled the value contribution within Apple's hardware to the silicon. Okay, and made some assumptions around that. Uh, we've got we saw that Apple you know based on our assumptions grew from about 15% CAGR from 2010 to 2023. We've got them at 6%, uh, I, 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 uh, sorry, 12% uh, from 23 to, to 28. And we account, we, we, we are assuming a $33 billion contribution from silicon. That's a, the value that we've allocated. Again, very importantly, this assumes no external sales of Apple silicon. David, anything you'd add on Apple? Well, Apple uh, quietly led the AI introduction. Um, they introduced large chips all, all the way back. They integrated um, the CPUs, the NPUs, the GPUs on the same chip. Uh, they have shared SRAM. That architecture is really, really strong for AI. Um, and, and they have taken that and put it into the M series, M1, M2, M3, and now M4. Um, they are a leader in the architectures required to go into AI. Um, and uh, they are obviously, uh, I, I, I don't believe they'll be long in responding to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Qualcomm uh, a, uh, PC AIs. So, they, they have been the reason why Microsoft put in the support for Apple, uh, sorry, for ARM-based uh, uh, processors because they were under pressure from Apple. And, and then making their own chip, designing their own chips confers real advantage. They design their own chips, they yeah. design everything, yep. yes. And, and, but that confers significant advantage to them. Okay, so let's talk about Micron, high bandwidth memory, similar to SK Hynix. Uh, demand way outstripping supply. Uh, Micron, you know, is, is executed, you know, very, very well. We actually see an acceleration in their CAGR. So we see them growing, virtually doubling from 16 billion um, to 31 billion, almost double. So CAGR accelerating from 8% in the first period to 14%. So, you know, very, very similar dynamics there. More competition. Uh, than say uh, some the likes of ASML, uh, but still very very strong supplier. Of course, you know different different markets. They design chips, and um, and uh, and have been a fantastic uh, uh, company uh, as well from the manufacturing side. All right, hyperscalers. So we 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 grouped hyperscalers into a single category here. That includes Meta, and 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 ByteDance, and of course the big three. 
uh, it excludes Broadcom's contribution of custom chips. So we're not double counting here. So remember, uh, Broadcom supports the development of GPUs or NPUs, XPUs, if you will, uh, for all the hyper or the, for the for the for the for the hyperscalers, specifically Google, where it's had a 10-year relationship, uh, Meta, where it's had about a four-year relationship, and we think ByteDance is the third. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, it's it's developing that that silicon for those companies, those hyperscalers. So we're counting the the revenue in Broadcom, but on balance, we don't think the hyperscalers are going to be directly competitive, competitive with NVIDIA's biggest chips. You know, we think their training and inference will be used for cost sensitive applications, inferencing at the edge. They're not going to keep pace with NVIDIA at the high end, you know, but they will get their fair share. I mean, Graviton probably accounts for about 20% of the workloads uh, of today. And so, you know, will training, you know, things like Inferentia and Trainium, and the counterparts at, at, at Google and, and uh, Microsoft follow a similar suit, you know, probably somewhere in that range, but they will not be a dominant factor in terms of disrupting, in our view, NVIDIA. At least that's the assumptions we make. David, anything you'd add to the hyperscaler? No, I, I agree completely. And all the hyperscalers are introducing NVIDIA systems. So they really, uh, uh, have to take NVIDIA because it's cheaper than they could make themselves. They, they can't make that platform themselves. Uh, it's going to be cheaper for the next few years, at, at four or five years. Um, and uh, they are all very large customers of NVIDIA. Yep. And then just coming back to, the, to close out here, others includes a long tail of suppliers across the value chain. You got TI, you got Global Foundries, you got Chinese players like Yangtze, CXMT, you got startups like Cerebrus in here. Um, this assumes, all the forecast really here assumes China doesn't invade Taiwan, that hot wars don't completely disrupt the market. And it also assumes that the AI PC market generally, as we said, follows Apple's trends from x86 to ARM. x86, about 13% of the market in 2010 dropped to 11% in 2023 and is projected to be 5% in 2028. Okay, here's a visual of what we just went through. In the interest of time, we'll just say that the two companies bucking the trend among the leaders are Intel and Samsung. They both design and manufacture chips and we think that brings unique challenges to each foundry. It's a very challenging business but it's critical to the future. Now, I'll also add, David, we, we failed to mention earlier, Micron also designs and manufactures chips, but it's memory, you know, they're not doing the, the, the XPUs and have been very, very successful. They actually design, uh, they actually manufacture in parts in the US. So they've perfected that model. Nonetheless, foundries for, for processors and GPUs is critical to the future for advanced manufacturing. While each of these firms, Samsung and Intel, face challenges to the extent that they can get through this difficult time, it's going to set them up for success in the 2030s, but we don't think it's going to be an easy road. So let's now dig into the AI PC a bit. Here's our forecast for PCs going back for, to 2009. And when PC volumes peaked in 2011, that was the beginning of Intel's real challenges in the descent because it, it, it meant volumes peaked. Even though most, most people didn't see it at the time, David Floyer, you made the call in 2013 with a research note on what was then wikibon.com, now the Cube Research. And the key points here are consumer volumes from the iPhone are what's going to drive innovation in AI PC specifically. The first true inference came out in 2017 with Apple using neural processing units, NPUs, to do facial recognition. And that innovation led to the first NPUs in laptops with Apple, as you can see in this chart, and the early example of AI PCs. Now, while volumes picked up during COVID, PC volumes that is, they've been constricting coming out of COVID, but AI PCs are, we believe, a game changer. Microsoft just reset the Windows stack for AI around ARM, WinARM, Following Apple's moves, and PC makers like Dell and HP and Lenovo are adopting uh, and, and following suit, and Qualcomm is seizing the day. And you can see in the green, 
what we think it means for AI PCs powered by ARM and what happens to x86 in the blue. Uh, they followed, that's 80, x86 PCs, really, again, following the Apple path, not as severe, but pretty much the x86 PC is going to become a managed decline market. The other point we'd make is we believe the entire PC experience is going to dramatically change. The interface is going to move to natural language, and the world's most ubiquitous productivity device is going to become a smart assistant via natural language. Its weight is going to drop, it's going to go on Ozempic. And as David mentioned, his battery life is going to quadruple to 24 hours a day, uh, or to 24 hours. You get a full day of battery life. Try to stay awake for that. In our view, this is going to shorten PC life cycles and create market momentum at the top line. David, your thoughts? Yeah, um, th this has been uh, something that I've been uh, talking about for, for for many years. So it's. Uh, it's nice to see that it's actually going uh, following the, the trends that we we forecast. Um, I, I think that Microsoft has been a major uh, push for this. Um, uh, they've had to because they saw licenses decreasing, um, and this is an opportunity for them to increase license licensing and increasing the number of PCs. However. Um, an awful lot of AI activity will also be on mobile. So I, I, I'm not super optimistic in saying that PCs are going to go back up again uh, to, their, to their 2011 volumes. Um, they'll get there close, but, but uh, mobile will be a, a very, very important uh, access to, um, uh, to AI as well as PCs. But we do have we do have PC volume surging, and I th but I think the key nuance here is that doesn't mean that we're going to return to the to that the, that those making PC chips are going to have sort of the glory days and the monopoly like you know experiences that that Intel enjoyed, because ARM volumes, as you pointed out before, are 10x ARM wafer volumes are 10x those of x86, and as a result, those designing and and manufacturing. ARM-based chips are on the learning curve and getting the advantage of Wright's law. And that's really, you know, TSM. NVIDIA was on the curve early. Apple was on the curve early. Tesla got on the curve early and many, many others. And now others, of course, jumping on. So that's really the nuanced approach, David, that I, again, I wanted to just clarify. While we have Absolutely. the PC volumes getting yeah. back there, it doesn't mean it's a return of, of the 90s. Okay. Right. Let, and, let's... And, and, and rights curve is underlying, uh, rights law is underlying all of this. And the, the ARM based has just got so uh, much better. ARM itself is providing immense value in, in halving the cost of design. Um, and and th that is the change in the marketplace and why uh, x86 is struggling. <clears throat> All right, let's close on some of the key points that we haven't hit on. AI inference at the edge is, is going to be, in our view, 80% of the spend by 2034. So we're saying in 10 years, 80% of the inference at the edge is 80% of the AI market is going to be inference at the edge. That's the workload that's going to be the dominant one. We had forecast this way back before in the COVID days. So, but this is a wide open field. I think the key point there is that it's not going to necessarily confer. Uh, a monopoly-like advantage. And so NVIDIA's got the monopoly just because whether or not it compete at inference, it says 40% of its volume, uh, its revenue right now is for inference, but of course that's mostly for chat GPT. Um, and, and, and so we'll see if NVIDIA can compete for the, the high volume, low cost, low power inference at the edge. Nonetheless, it's not going to confer, in our opinion, those type of monopoly advantages because it's going to be much more diffuse. We're going to talk about energy needs here for a moment. Energy needs are going to necessitate new thinking, nuclear, solar, wind, large local batteries. David, I'm sure you'll have something to say on that. Uh, and geopolitical risks. Obviously, China and Taiwan, hot wars. Our assumptions are that these things don't disrupt to the extent that they do. And there's probably a good chance that they do. Maybe give it a 25 to 30 percent probability that that, that something bad happens to disrupt the supply chain and that will throw our, uh, our forecast off, but we're assuming a quote unquote 
frictionless environment like your your days in thermodynamics class in uh, in college <laughs> and make it simple so you can actually you know determine what the market would look like if 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 but that's you know the assumption that we're making that these things don't happen and then Intel foundry scenarios if gate all around and if backside power and if NAEUV and 14A yields all come through by 2027 Intel is going to be in a much, much better position than we're forecasting here in a very well position for the 2030s. Uh, again, that's not our assumption, uh, but that is a risk to our forecast and we're rooting for them. And then alternative approaches from very well, well funded startups or mega M&A that the hyperscalers might do. Um, that's something that we're obviously watching, uh, but we don't see that disrupting NVIDIA's monopoly or the big four's momentum as we see it. David, I'll give you the last word. Um, this is just an exciting area. Could you just put up the list there just for a second, uh, the last slide? Yeah, um, I mean, if we take that inference, the uh, wide open, uh, there's so much opportunity at the edge and AI chips will be at the edge and a lot of the processing will be initially there. There will be dist distribution of a huge amount of AI processing. Um, and as you say, the large local batteries are going to change the whole of the uh, supply of uh, power. Um, that's, that's an amazing uh, change that, that's going to happen over the next decade. Um, I don't have anything more to say on geopolitical risk. Um, the the uh, the Intel is uh, is uh, my my hopes and my 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 belief and my hopes is that sorry not my belief my hope my, my I'm rooting for them I'm just saying that they are, have a lot of significant business challenges to to compete with TSMC. Okay, David. Thanks so much for your collaboration. Uh, the, this is just a start of, uh, this actually kind of get in the middle. We started this quite some time ago and I'm sure it will continue. Really appreciate your time and your energy going into these forecasts and your time today. Thank you for coming on Breaking Analysis. Very, very welcome. Very interesting. All right, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman who's solo today on production and, our, and does our, do our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hofe is our editor-in-chief over at SiliconANGLE.com. Remember, all these episodes, they're available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. They publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn post and check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.